Look, niggas say they real, but they been fake. Fans say I'm nice, but I been great. I ball hard, slam dunk, watch the rent break. I'm going in, tongue out like MJ. Tongue out like MJ. Fourth quarter, tongue out like MJ. Game seven, tongue out like MJ. I'm going hard, man, even on my off days. Niggas say they real, but they been fake. Fans say I'm nice, but I been great. I ball hard, slam dunk, watch the rent break. I'm going in, tongue out like MJ. Tongue out like MJ. Fourth quarter, tongue out like MJ. Game seven, tongue out like MJ. Damn right. Going hard, man, even on my off days. Y'all should know I mean business when my tongue come out. Me and my boss be a weapon, bring the guns out. I hear you say you getting dope, but in the strip club, you don't bring no funds out. I dumb out when niggas talking that shit. I can talk it like I walk in, man. New York at that big. I thought your girl was from Atlanta where she talking my dick. I can make you hate me more when I'm parking my six. And I'ma do it all for the cause. Young niggas know I got the juice in the sauce. Fuck admit they hate until I hate to get lost. All opinions they concerns, they can see the front door. I don't want more. We ain't friends, I don't really need my hand shook. Trying to be like me, I should write a damn book. James Harden, you should let that man cook. When you see me going in, y'all just stand there shook. Look, niggas say they real, but they been fake. Fans say I'm nice, but I been great. I ball hard, slam dunk, watch the red break. I'm going in, tongue out like MJ. Tongue out like MJ. Fourth quarter, tongue out like MJ. Game seven, tongue out like MJ. I'm going hard, yeah. man, even yeah. on my off days. Step up in the stool when I flame it up. Fourth quarter, put me in, I'ma catch us up. Winning three, though, that's me, and my stats is crazy. Hustle on 100 and my swag too wavy, yeah. Now who really want a ball? All my dogs winning and we here to take it all. Tell shorty straight to her face, tell her I'm a boss. If I ever take a loss, bounce back, it's no loss. Watch who you cross, but I'ma cross you and hit this layup. Text from a dime and she say she want to lay up. So I'ma get straight to the naughty. Beat it all up till she can't feel her body. Back to the gym, cause you know I stay flexing. Keep some real players and some baddies in my section. For real, I'm MJ hanging from the rim. I just score with an and one, that's her plus a friend. It's easy. Huh. Niggas say they real, but they been fake Fans say I'm nice, but I been great I ball hard, slam dunk, watch the rent break I'm going in, tongue out like MJ Tongue out like MJ Fourth quarter, tongue out like MJ Game seven, tongue out like MJ I'm going hard, man, even on my off days Man, even on my off days Man, even on my off days All right. <laughs> Welcome, welcome, welcome Welcome back to I'm Perspective Radio Episode 13 Black Mental Health I'm your co-host Jorel H. Whitfield And I am Nasi Alam And we are excited to be here with some amazing guests here today. Um, men that I can call all my friends. Um, and so tonight's episode, we're going to be talking on a topic that rarely gets discussed. We started this conversation during our first year that I Am Perspective was in session. We had our event in Washington, D.C. called the Black Men's Mental Health and Trauma. and through that discussion, we realized that there's really not that many spaces. Um, you know, as men, there's not that many spaces for vulnerability, but for black men specifically, there's even less spaces offered. And so we are really excited for this conversation here today. Um, and we have some wonderful guests with us that I'm going to give the mic over to to introduce themselves. If you could just tell us your name, um, what you do, and why you're here today, why you chose to come on for this show. Hello everyone, my name is Q, and what I do, I'm a photographer, and the purpose of me being on this radio show is basically to break down what goes on as far as in black mental health, like, you know, um, how we look at poverty society, and, um, you know, just our point of view of being the black man. Hello everybody, my name is Demarcus and I am a graphic designer, I'm a visual artist and I'm a brand coach, life coach, certified life coach. And I'm here today to give my experience and my perspective on 
mental health based off um, myself and then some friends that I know and people that I've encountered within like life coaching. Mm-hmm. Hi, my name is uh, Tamlin Jasir. I am the founder of Afro Zamari Podcast Festival. Uh, I am life coach with Fort Moment and the director of Youth Empowerment Services for Mastermind Connect, um, which I'm also a member of, which is a men's group. And uh, here in New York, LA, Colorado, and DC. Wow, that's amazing. Brothers are all basically busy as shit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> and what about you, Jerome? Oh, I am, what am I doing? Introducing, my name is Joe Rell Whitfield. Mm-hmm. I am an international spoken word artist. I'm a web designer. I am a teacher. Uh, and I'm also a co-founder of Iron Perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I mentor, I, I do a lot, man. Damn, I do a lot. And, um, and I host a radio show, believe it or not, you know. Um, <laughs> And I guess with, what, with, with that being said, with you guys doing a lot and I'm doing a lot, how the hell are you? How are you? Good <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well. No, no, no. I mean that. Like, how's your, how's your mental? Mental health check-in. It's good. Yeah. But to be honest, I, I'm, I feel good. I feel, you know, I'm well. Uh, you know, overall, um, I, don't, I don't believe that I'm, I overthink a lot of things. So I feel like I'm in a good space in my life. I'm going to say it didn't sound like you overthought that at all. Nah. Not at all. All right. My bro, how are you, Talib? Oh, well, tired a little bit just because it's been a long day. Um, However, I'm a person who who lives life wanting and desiring to feel alive in in any and everything I do. Mm -hmm. And so um, the work right now is, is definitely create space for me to feel alive, come alive, do the things I want to do. And so I feel, I feel good. There, there, there are the moments where it gets overwhelming. Um, there are the moments where all of the default behaviors and ideas about myself show up. Um, but as a creative, as a person, as a founder, all those sorts of things, I'm, I'm real clear on that whatever happens in my life, I get to create. So that includes overwhelm. Mm. I'm gonna do it better. Okay. Now, when you gentlemen heard that question, uh, when you hear that question, do you feel like you really have a space to answer that genuinely? Not to say that your answers weren't genuine. You know, we're, we've created a different space right now. But when the average person asks, "Hey, how you doing? How are you feeling? Do you feel like, as a black man, you have the space to be like, "Yo, this is how I'm really feeling." Or, do you feel see yourself kind of tucking it in for the most part? Um, I think for me, I I think I give myself permission to answer it authentically. I think um, maybe when I was younger, I probably would be like, "Oh, I'm fine, everything's good," you know. Um, and I also try not to like weight anybody down, you know, because of like giving my energy over. But for the most part, when I mean, I feel like that is a very valid and important question. So, um, when people ask me that question, I am authentic and I may say like, yo, I'm exhausted, Mm -hmm. you know, but I'm grateful and I'm blessed, you know, um, I'm excited, you know, about like the spaces and stuff that I'm creating or that I'm in, but it's like, there are times where I'm just like exhausted, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. but then also I think what ended up becoming important was not only do I, you know, give my answer, but I also take the time to authentically ask like one of my brothers the same question. You know, like how are you? Or I say like, yo, mental health check in, like what's up with you? Right. Like, what's going on? How can I support you? Anything mm-hmm. going on? Yeah. You know, is there anything you're not telling anybody, you mm-hmm. know, that you wanna like this is a safe space, like you can tell me anything, you know. Yeah. So yeah. So I had just heard in your answer, I'm good. Okay. And so um I like to ask Jarrell almost everything probably too much how are you because when he says i'm good i don't actually believe him and (laughs) 
Because I feel like it's this generic answer when you say I'm good. Are you really good? I'm good. I'm breathing, ain't and, I? I'm living this world. And then when you're and when you're saying this, and you know, I'm looking at your faces, and it doesn't speak. I'm good. <laughs> you don't look like you're good. <laughs> you have a face. <laughs> so, um, really, my question is like. You know, when you're saying I'm good, what is the real underlying basis for that? And I'm asking you this too. Oh my gosh. I'm the interviewer. What do you mean? This no, is no, no. This, you're right for now. Um, <laughs> what does I'm good mean? Like, why do you feel the need to say that when I know sometimes you're not good? <laughs> was, that, was that a lie? Come on, I, I done picked up the men. I said, listen, the men, we like to talk. Yeah, sure, yeah. God. I got a lot to say. Mm. All right. So, all right. If, you can't see me if you're watching, so <laughs> don't worry voice, about though? it. It's, it's a voice. <laughs> I'm coming from above. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Typically, when a black man says he's good, he's like, yo, I'm alive. I'm breathing. Um, what a lot of people don't realize, and being a black man in this community, is that we are at the bottom of everything. We get a lack of respect from not only the communities that we live in, but even from the black women or just women in general, mm -hmm. where they look at us a certain way because we are black men. Like you said, Everyone in here is busy as shit. But it doesn't matter that we're busy and we're working to do better. We're still looked at as nothing. And when we say we good, it's like, yo, we woke up. And and it, and it just is that way. Because no matter what we do, it's never it never seems to be good enough in the community. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's horrible. Yeah, thank you. Is that a shared sentiment? You can have your own perspective, of course. That's what our perspective is, you know? Mm -hmm. Understandable. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, personally, me, when I say I'm well, like you say, when you asked, um, how do I feel about that question? And, you know, um, I feel like when a person asks me how I'm doing, I'm actually answering uh, genuinely because I feel like I don't let a lot of things get to me, you, you know? So, either, like, overall, I feel like we all, as black men, you know, um, we do think about things you know, in general, but the way we feel is sometimes it could be a moment thing or it could be genuine on how we really feel every day. So when I say I'm well, I believe that I um I feel that way usually, like that's my usual feel. But there there, there, there could be a moment where I'm stressed because that, you know, that day could have been stressful, you know. So I do believe that I go by my mood. So that's how I determine, like, um how I feel usually. But overall, I could say that I'm well because... I'm at peace with myself more than anything. I'm not, you know, doing anything to feel like I got to fit in somewhere. As long as I got my own peace, that's what counts most. And like you mentioned, um, DeMarcus, uh, as far as, in, um, like, checking in with others, which I feel like sometimes when I know somebody else is doing good, it makes me feel good. So it's a genuine thing as well. Sometimes you just got to check in and see, you know, what somebody else is going through and, that could probably change your mood as well, but as long as they, you know, your answer could make them feel better. So, you know, um, as long as I feel like I'm staying above water and I'm, you know, um, grateful for waking up every day and, you know, um, some simple and humble it's just, things. Yeah, it's yeah. just about being humble and that's what makes me feel well. Like, it's just about waking up and, you know, seeing another day. And as long as I could see that and do what I need to do and provide, um, I feel well, you know? How about you guys? Um, I think it's interesting. I, th I think it's interesting that it's, it's um, the experiences that I've had in places that I've been, like, mm -hmm. it's the same answer across the board in, like, different cultures. Like, I'm, I'm originally from Texas, but in Texas we say, like, I'm fine. That's that's the word, I'm fine. But in New York it's like, yo, I'm good. Right. It's like if you're in the Dominican Republic, it's like total bien. You know, yeah, yeah. it's the same <laughs> thing. You know, but I think also it's like, what I've come to realize um, since becoming like a life coach, I asked the question twice. So I'd be like, yo, how are you? And everybody would be like, yo, I'm good. And I'd just like kind of look. And I'd be like, well, how are you? Mm -hmm. And it always like, it, it like takes it a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, wow. But I'd be like, yo, how are you? Or oh, if they say like, yo, I'm good, I'd be like, I'd say something like, if you could choose another word besides good, how are you? 
you know, there's so many different words you can mm-hmm. choose besides I'm good. And everyone's like, oh, or, I feel amazing. Or like, I'm all right. Or I'm so, so, you know, muscle man. You know, it gives and, people an opportunity to really yeah, think about how they right, are. Right, 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 right. So I just noticed like, yeah. um, if I just go just, just one step, one question more, like I'll get like a different answer, you know. Tell it. I say I'm good a lot because one thing I, I am is the first thing. I'm tired right now, so I'm, my face is giving rest in the tired face. <laughs> but, um, but for the most part, growing up in the way in which I did, um, I'm very discerning for where to lay that down at. Like I'm, if, if I, if I'm if I can discern that you're asking me that just to ask me that for your shits and giggles, then <laughs> oh, yes, it's yes. already breached. For your, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for <laughs> so um, then I'm going to say I'm good and keep it moving because I don't need to expand on that, especially if you don't have the capacity to understand, care for, or um, I don't. As long as I understand, it doesn't. I'm not concerned with someone else's understanding. But um, if you don't have the capacity to to uh, deal with whatever it is that I could provide, then what what would be the point of that for me? Mm-hmm. Um, that's just my perspective. So um, I'm very discerning in, in in my what I give out, what the energy I give, the conversation I give. I don't I don't talk a lot for a reason. You know, it's just if it's going to land somewhere and, 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 and yield something, then let's go. If it's just, <coughs> I'm good, thanks for asking, then let's go with that too. It's yeah. just fine, you know. Okay. So that's why I say I'm good, because yeah. I am good. Depending on who you are. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Right. Now, what I just heard, uh, especially from DeMarcus, when you were saying, really essentially, like, this is across the board kind of thing, mm-hmm. you know, different cultures of men. Uh, as Nussie and I were talking about this topic, sorry, <laughs> uh, I was saying like I experience my conversations with black men as men first. You know, we all, and we actually even mentioned Q. I was like, if I sit down with Q and we just meet each other and we kicking it, I don't need to really relate to him as a black man. We kind of already got that. Right. So we talk amongst each other as men. Um, but with that said. And with what Prof kind of just threw out there as well, um, what is your experience as a black man? And again, this can be your perspective. It could be all good. It doesn't need to be, you know. Prof gave his perspective earlier, but uh, as a black man, what is? How is your life? <laughs> how is your experience in in this world? Um. Well, I feel like as a black man, one I want to say is definitely a blessing. I, I must say that it's a blessing. Um, honored to be a black man. But it's also um, complicated at times, you know, because of the fact that being a black man and being a strong black man and being an educated black man and being a man that, you know, do do the most to provide or make sure everything is, is good for him and his family or however, it's still not enough, you know. Um, and also it's like it's not that it's not enough to like where it's like it's not a, it's not that it's not enough to like uh, our families, but it's not enough to society. You know what I mean? Where exactly. as a black man, we we get judged a lot for anything. We could do good and we still get judged. You know, like we could provide something for a neighborhood, but we still get judged. You know, and it's not it's sad to say we get judged by our own people. So getting judged by our own people, that's what makes it worse. So where it, it makes any other race feel like they could judge us too. So being a black man, I feel like it's a blessing, but then it's dangerous because you could walk into a place and it's like, I guess they, they, they got to fulfill you out in that place. They got to see how you are as a person. But if they feel like you danger to that place, they're going to feel a way about it. They might want to do something about it. Or you got some people that might want, uh, if you're in a restaurant, they might want to sit next to you because you're black. They might move. So I feel like um overall, being a black man is a blessing, but it's also dangerous. And it's also where it's like, um, you know, it's just respecting who you are and respecting what skin you in, you know? Be honest for what you like for what you are. 
Yo, I, w- I would Dope. love to touch on what Q said. Mm-hmm. And, and it's like being in society, we're looked at a certain way. People fear us. And being black men, one thing that we are not allowed to have is black men or emotions. And that's one of the reasons why we tend to say we are good. We are okay. I'm all right. Mm-hmm. Or whatever it is. It's, it's, it's a horrible thing. Because as being black men, if we gave our emotions, we are considered weak. Mm-hmm. But it's because during the time of slavery and those things, we, we were... And this is my perspective. I'm, I'm not yeah. de- definitely saying... This is what everybody else should think, but we were beaten. The strongest man, the most built man that was able to work the fields and do what he did and was and was considered the most intimidating to those around him was beaten in front of the black woman. Mm. Mm. And it was like, I can't even respect you for what you are. You look strong, but you're not. Because the person that is beating you is a scrawny white man that weighs ninety eight pounds wet. <laughs> no, but but it's, it, yeah. but if you think about it, and it's and it's put out there so much that it's what people tend to see, mm-hmm. and they don't see nothing else. When we stick out like a sore thumb and choose to be powerful as black men, we are told we need to lay down. What I hear in that is trauma. And so I think, um, can I, can I real quick? yeah. Um, so I think it's 2020, right? And I think that um, as as people, it's, it's it's sort of dangerous to continue to perpetuate a lot of things that um, may have been true at one time, still true in a lot of different families pathologies, communities, but for me, it's, it's truly up to us to, um, to define and identify who we are, mm-hmm. um, what, we, what we are, and, and what we're creating, right? So I'll sum it up because I have a lot of shit to say about that, but I'll, I'll sum it up <laughs> to this. Um, I don't... I could give two two shits about society's lens, society's eyeballs, um, society's condemnation of uh, black men, or you know, period. And so, for me, I, I look at it like the ocean, right? Um, I love the ocean. Water is my aesthetic, and I, and I love the ocean. But there's sharks in the ocean, and there's riptides in the ocean. And I can sit my ass on the sand and never enter that ocean because of my fears of what's what's happening in this ocean, right? But the ocean is mine because I'm here. I live here. I'm a human being, and I get to be in that ocean just like anything else, anybody else. And so I liken that to being a, a black person, um, girl, child, boy, transgender, whatever it is. Um, I know what's out here. I know the dangers. As a black man, I know what I'm up against. I know what they may or may not think about me. I give two fucks again, but I know what it is. However, um, that's a deli- the, it's such a deliberate act to have us continue to believe that we aren't allowed our emotions, that we aren't allowed our, um, our what we are allowed to have just being basic human, having basic human rights. Um, and it's for us to continue to say that we're not allowed to speak our emotions. We are. You speak, I, I'll speak my emotion any moment I want to. It, it's up to us to, to make sure that we get to do that. Um, and it's up to us to make sure that we lead by example in the way in which that, if I speak my emotions in this space and, uh, and another brother is not willing or able or capable of, He just saw possibility in me. But the more I continue to say, I can't, no one wants me to, I'm not allowed to, then I continue to perpetuate. And I'm not saying anything against what you're saying. But what I am saying is that there's a certain freedom that we have access to that we are perpetuating 
against when we continue that same narrative. And I would definitely agree with you because for me, I, I only said what I said because I know that's what society mm -hmm. projects. Absolutely. Me, as you said, me, I will sit there. I'm emotional with my kids. I lost the whole relationship of 20 years because I chose to be emotional and I wasn't accepted as being an emotional black man. Mm -hmm. It was, I was weak. It was, no, you're supposed to be the man. You're supposed to do this. And it's like, no, but when I'm with you, I'm supposed to be vulnerable as you being my black queen and me being your king. And, and that's just what it was. And it was because they fell to what society thought of what we were supposed to do. Now, I love, again, what I jump in and talk about what Iron Perspective is, is because what I see and what I hear, and I know Nussie as well, is uh, just perspectives, mm -hmm. right? And what we hope to give to the viewer and the listener is a palleted look at what black men looks like. You know, if we went deep enough, all of us would have different maybe viewpoints uh, to opinions about it. And... I, I definitely understand where that perspective is coming from. I know a lot of men who still feel that way. They mm -hmm. still feel oppressed. And then I know gentlemen like you who are like, yo, you know. And before, because I, I definitely want to hear uh, your perspective as well. Uh, you've been listening patiently. I wrote down, as you were saying that, that viewpoint that you got to now, do you see that as a journey for you? Or is that how you've always felt? Is that something, like your understanding of what you just explained, is that something you had to get to? I sort of, kind of. Um, I was raised in the American education system. So there's a lot of deliberate acts to, uh, to uh, limit my mind and For limit sure. my experience. Right. Um, world, uh, world view is everything. You know, once you see possibility in other people, um, once you experience things, you know, you know different. Um, and you can either choose I'm a disruptor, you know, so so my nature is disruption. My nature <laughs> is um, rebellion, and um, so I guess it was a journey, but, but it wasn't a hard journey because um, one thing I learned back in the day when I had uh, handcuffs on the back of a, of a cop car because I was a lookout doing stupid shit, I was like, oh, this ain't, this ain't, this ain't my bag. <laughs> this ain't my work for me. Um, yeah, this ain't my this bag. Ain't, this ain't, yeah, this and, ain't. Um, and, and more than anything, I said, I don't want y'all having access to me like this. Right. This is too much access that I I have given you. Um, and so that's the things that clicked for me. Like, my rebellion and my disruption said, you don't get to have me the way in which you want me. Right, right. So that, that's how I arrived. Yeah. in this situation. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So what I heard in a, lot, in a lot of your shares is that there's a certain level of trauma that black men go through, whether, you know, and I don't want to talk so much about the past and things that didn't happen to you guys personally, um, but there is trauma in things, as Q was mentioning, about being in certain spaces and being treated in a certain kind of way, right? Because then that create something in you, whether it's a defense, whether it's a, you know, whatever that is, you're looking to navigate this new situation because of whatever happened to you in the past. Um, what are some traumas specifically that you have dealt with in your lives that would have affected your emotions or your ability to show vulnerability? And whether or not you've gotten over it or not, you know, that might be something you have dealt with or you may not have dealt with yet? Marcus, do you? Um, I think for me, uh, like for me, it's kind of like, it's a two-part answer. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like living in New York, there's, uh, there's like a Texas side of me and then there's like a New York side of me. Mm -hmm. And um, in Texas, I literally, I don't, I don't know what it was, but in Texas, I, I'm sometimes like fearful. I'm, I think I'm more fearful being a black man there than I am here mm -hmm. and um, uh, the trauma that I had was I used to always get stopped by the police and I had like no re no understanding of like why was this happening you know like um, in my mind I had these stories that I was creating of like why are they stopping me you know I do X Y and Z I like everything I felt was like the right way you know 
but I think there was a time where I used to have um, cornrows. And when I had cornrows, like, I just attracted all kind of, like, trouble. Mm-hmm. Like, um, like I, I, I always got stopped by, like, the state troopers. Um, I always got stopped by, like, just a police, just, like, a random check. I remember one time um, I was in a car with a friend, and, like, my friend was driving, and I was asleep. And the police pulled us over, and I was the one. Like, he woke me up, and I was the one that he started messing with. I wasn't even driving a car, you know? So it's things like that. Um, but then once I got to New York, I didn't really have any more, um, like, problems like that. Um, the problem that I did have, like, kind of like what Q was talking about, was I faced more, like, black-on-black black racism. I had never experienced that before. In I think, Texas? Yeah, no, when in I got New to York. New York. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. You, you, in Texas, I didn't experience that, but when I got to New York, I experienced that. I think when I got here, like um, a lot of African Americans thought I was Dominican, and I was mm-hmm. like, I'm black, yeah. you know. Y'all but, don't got Dominicans. Yeah, black. we don't have Dominicans <laughs> like that, you know. So, but it was just like I was, I was getting that, and then I think um, probably one of the most traumatic things that I had that happened to me here was um, stop and frisk. Yeah. You know, um, I, I, I originally thought it was kind of like a joke, and I didn't. There was at the time I don't think there was a name to it. I didn't know it was stop and frisk. It you know, was just the NYPD. Yeah, it was just NYPD. You know, it's like my boys and I. We were like at the Dominican parade, mm-hmm. and we were leaving. We were in a taxi, like headed back downtown, and then like the police just pulled us over, and um, and he pulled one of my friends out the car, and we all were in the car like laughing, you know, but then he start they start pulling us out like one by one. And then um, I was like, yo, like, I think I was like the hot headed one, you know, like, why are you pulling us out? Like, we all college educated, like, right. you know, and that was really was just like, but at the time, I didn't know, like, kind of like what my rights were, you know, and um, like, even to this day, you know, like, it's, it's still traumatic. I still think about it, you know, because it was like, we were in a cab, like, it wasn't like we were walking, like, oh, you fit a description. I'm like, what do you mean we fit a description? It's four dudes, like, in a taxi. Mm-hmm. Like a yellow taxi. <laughs> you gonna pull over a yellow taxi and pull us out one by one, you mm-hmm. know? I was like, give me a badge number. Wouldn't give us the number, you know? So, yeah, like that's the most traumatic thing that I've like. And you're one occurs. of how many black men that have had to deal with that situation? Yo, I don't know. Yeah, we're and, talking about, I, I was trying to look at, I know for sure we're talking about five million. Mm-hmm. That was the number that we threw out. There mm-hmm. was a peak number of 800,000 stops one year. Early on when he did it, um, and the things that I talk about often about being black, there's so many things. I love how you started off with like, I was, being a black man is amazing. I try to lead with that. But the realities of it is that I grew up in New York before Stop and Frisk was Stop and Frisk. When Giuliani was out here, you know, this guy who was gonna run for president somehow, you know what I mean? And Stop and Frisk was just paroling. They would just jump out, throw people up against the wall, run, run your pockets. Like run your pockets was a police Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and what does that do when Nasi says as far as trauma, where that's just kind of like what we've been through, you know? What does that look like for people who've never been pulled over? I have friends who, non-black yeah. friends who've never been pulled over by the police. It, it's a shock to me, you know? Um, and as a non-black friend, um, I also, I'm very aware that, you know, um, sometimes my friend here likes to do things and then the cops pull him over and then I get very nervous if I'm on the phone with you because I'm aware of sound hella suspect <laughs> sometimes I mean sometimes my right. yeah, I'm not, I'm not, anyway I won't, yeah, do you want your business or whatever um, yeah so like I know that like I know I feel an extra sense of nervousness when I'm on the front I'm dealing with a black friend, a black male friend versus maybe a Bengali Muslim friend. Like maybe they would get treated differently. Like I'm aware that there's a difference even in interacting. Um, and it's not completely like Muslim men kind of deal with it too, but I do recognize that there's a certain stereotype and a certain um, disadvantage of being a black man being pulled over. I know how I feel, yeah. but how, how is your relationship with the police at this point in your life? Um, <laughs> well, being from where I'm from, which is Rail Hub, Brooklyn, um, I mean, real, uh, as far as the police, I never really liked the cops, you know? Like, I don't believe that every cop is bad, but I just feel like, um, all 
cops have their ways, and there's and, and not to say it like this, you got black cops that have their ways with other black men as well. You know, like as much as they got power too in the situation, they don't they they feel like they got to prove a point to the white guy. You know what I mean to the white cop, and to me, you know, that's why I feel like all cops are not bad. But then again, that just shows like that bad just was basically saving you. That's making you a a different person. Because when you see a person, that same cop in, in, in a store, it's like they're a whole different man. You know, that black cop. I'm talking about even that white cop, but that white cop might still have that look against you. Like, yeah, I'm still the same person with that badge, without that badge. But that's they they personal feelings, you know. But compared to that black cop, when you see him, he want to shake your hand and be like, "Man, it wasn't like that." But you know, I have my partner there, and it's like, uh, you could have still been bigger than that as a black man. So, to me, when it comes to police, I just feel like the way police are, it's not about their job no more. It's about their personal feeling. You know, when they feel like they, they, they got that gun next to them, they, they urge to shoot. They they ready because that's what they feel like they were trained to do. I, I believe that there was a saying, you know, that they had shoot first or something like that. If I'm Ask not questions mis- later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was just like, I think they really had a law. Like, they, they, they was like, they, they goal was to shoot first. You know, it wasn't really no, like, stop and frisk. They was really trying to kill you, especially if you was black because they feel like you was harmful. They take their time on a white man. They they actually stop and frisk that man. But a black man, they gonna they gonna find a reason to kill you. Your cell phone came out. Boom, we had a gun. You know, so so your sentiment has stayed relatively the same. Well, yeah, because I feel like um honestly speaking, I just feel like pol- like I said, all police ain't bad, but I just don't like police. You know, I don't got nothing against a lot of them, but the majority, yeah. Do you guys believe there should be a certain level of camaraderie between black men, regardless of profession or background or socioeconomic class? <laughs> May you elaborate that a little bit? Okay. Um, you wanna yes, of course. Of course, yeah. of course we should. Mm-hmm. Um... Should black men stick together? This is really the question. Oh, um, yeah. oh well. Can, I, can we go back to the cop thing? Yes. Yeah, I, like we, um, I don't know if you have a perspective. Nah, no, I'm good. Go ahead, go ahead. Listen, no, I'm good. No, but like the, um, the cops are part of the, those are the riptides and the sharks I was talking about in the ocean, right? And so um, I think one of the things that, that we get to recognize is that, first of all, it's obviously it's a power structure, a mm-hmm. struggle that's going on there. Um, and... Um, I think as black people, we, we, we really have to recognize that it's about our bodies. It ain't about our brain, it ain't about where we went to school, it ain't about the car we drive. They don't, that, they don't give a shit about what car we drive. And they don't give a shit. They don't care about that. They just care that you have a physical body that they want to take out. The mm-hmm. less of you is better. Um, and, and I truly, that's my perspective. My perspective is that um, since the black code, since overseers, since um, since we were brought here, and it, it doesn't just happen here. We're talking about apartheid, South Africa. We're talking about Australia. We're talking about anywhere where um, black people are a majority, um, and white people are scarce and um, and and fear based, and they make their decisions that way. Um, it's about killing the black body taking the physical body outside, out of this earth. Um, and because these are trained shooters, so why do they have to shoot to kill? I don't want to be shot in my pinky toe. You tell me you don't shoot me in my pinky toe, I'm going to stop right then and there. But like, you got it. You got me. My hands are up now. So you can shoot me in my kneecap, you can shoot me in my leg, you can shoot me in my foot, you can shoot me in my arm, my shoulder, wherever. You're a trained shooter. You know how to do this. All right. But you want to take me, you want to kill me. You want me gone. So that's another whole another psychosis that, that we're dealing with when we're dealing with um, cops that I think that we do a lot of, and again, deliberate media surface conversation around it, but these are just literally people who want, who have their own shit, their own psychosis, their own mental illness um, that's unfortunately dealt, dealt with white and, and, and any other body. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's the, the crux of the issue. And so um, 
wanting or trying to implore a person like that who just wants your physical body gone is pretty much it's, it's pretty pointless. That's a, a powerful point there. Uh, again, why we have this platform mm -hmm. is because I don't think that there are people who see black men, women as well, but we're speaking specifically about men, black people, um, and that black people feel this way about the people who are supposed to protect them. You know, so it's a thing to say, oh yeah, Black Lives Matter and this da da da. But what is it when it's like embedded in how you feel? You know, I don't know how many people are out here, and we love to have the conversation. That's a part of my wanting to talk to other races. Like, yo, how do you feel about the police? Do you feel like you're, they're, like they're trying to annihilate you? You know, they, there's people here that feel like the police are trying to get rid of them. And I don't know if everyone can really understand that. It's just like, oh, I hear what you're going through. And that's what separates empathy. You know, where we're really trying to get these conversations and get these viewpoints of like, wow, Man, these men look like hard-working, regular men, but underneath it all, you might have this fear for your life. Or as you said, it's dangerous being... That's a, that's a, a massive word. It's just a uniform. Mm -hmm. that's it doesn't make them special. It does, but not only that, but it doesn't change. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the same person in a different uniform or different mm -hmm. profession. It's just a human being in a uniform doing what a human being wants to do with whatever particular group of people he wants to do. It doesn't, cop is just a title. It doesn't make them not less human or less of that psychosis. Right. Yeah. So I'll bet on that because I can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> now there's clearly other people, you know, if we had a more diverse group of black men in here, there's black men who love the police, there's black police officers, um, there are black people who support the police and have um, different viewpoints on it, right? So I guess in, in what Nancy was saying earlier, thinking about black men and how many different versions of us, because I personally think there's just a myriad of blackness, when it comes, especially when it comes to black, black people, black men. If you just want to go regional, we're talking about different types of black people, right? Um, so what does that look like, or do you think it's necessary that we have camaraderie amongst black people? Is there camaraderie amongst other cultures? Do you, do you witness? I throw this out there like I always I grew up thinking like white people were one band of people, you know, like it was like white people and they all had a flag and they were all cool. No matter where they went, they had a white person check in. I don't know what the <laughs> what the dap up was. I mean, was. Definitely, it's definitely like that with Bengalis. I'll tell yeah, you. Yeah, right. But I thought that was the case, and then I get older, and I'm like, you know, it's it's definitely not really like that. So. Uh, um, <clears throat> well, to answer that question, I do like like you said, growing up always looked at like black as black you know and um like you said looking at our skin color it was just black you know like when you black you feel like we always won but um as time got as time went by and as i got older i realized that um nah it's not really that way because if you really meet like a a, a, a african-american like a real african person you know or a caribbean person some of them look at just other black people different you know, like they feel like you're not from the Caribbeans. You don't understand where we coming from or how we are. Or even, you know, African people that are Muslim, you know, they look at it different. Like they look at other blacks different. Like, well, no, we different from y'all. So I feel like, um, yes, growing up, I did feel like black was one, like a whole. And I, I in a way, I feel like we still are. But it's just certain religion or like or, 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 or race wise, they look at things different from how. A person that's not Muslim or Caribbean, you know, coming from that part of it, they they don't understand like how we all we all are one, you know. So that's how I look at it. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a whole different segment as well. Mm -hmm. I, I want to hear the rest of the answers. Though. I would um, I would love to see like camaraderie or for us to like get to a place of where we all can like support each other and work with each other and like take our talents and our experiences and bring it together, like we would be like some powerful motherfuckers, you know, just like straight up, mm -hmm. um, like running the world, mm -hmm. you know, um, if we just tap into it. Um, but I feel like there's so many different um, experiences that people have had that separates us, um, that it, it's kind of like difficult for us to come together because we've all had like different experiences and maybe like 
our parents have had different experiences and they projected that onto us and you know you don't trust this person or you know um, you're black but you're Caribbean you're not African American you know there's so many different like traumas and hang-ups that we all have like sometimes it's difficult to like connect yeah. you know like you want to connect but I think like you know being I think like maybe it starts with like finding like a clique or finding like a group or creating your table and then you're bringing like seats to the table you know for a common interest or something and then maybe that creates like the camaraderie and the community and the support you know but I would definitely love to see that you know I try to do that like you know <laughs> <laughs> you know with just like the people that I know you know I'm um, like with me it's like I just I try to like get people to activate their spiritual gifts you know and we all like work together you know then like we start from this circle then it opens up to another circle and opens up to another circle and open up to another circle and then it creates that you know but not everybody's trusting you know you, you guys are talking about a lot of uh, man we can go into three four five hours of course about mm -hmm. why that even is the case um, why why we're separate. Um, I personally believe that, that black men, black people are unique people. I see and I talk about this all the time. Uh, I've, we've led many conversations with Caribbeans and different black folks, Africans, and uh, I think it's important to know who black people are here, black men. Uh, I don't want to separate us at all, because like, I know we're all one. <laughs> like We really need to come together. But when we say things like come together, it kind of irks me because it makes it seem like we're just not, you know, like we're just choosing not to. And I think that ignores why we're not, ignores the history, ignores what was set up for us, the sharks, the riptides that would keep us from seeing a Haitian brother as black or, man, shit, Texas folks. I know I went to school out of state. And when I went to school out of state, I went to school in Maryland, and that was my first time recognizing that there were, there were black people from different cities that didn't fuck with each other mm -hmm. for no reason. You from where? You from New York? Oh my God, I've been around this country as a New Yorker. <laughs> like, you, you know? And so it's very interesting, even on that level, going to some smaller cities, bigger cities, and having to get through that uh, with other black people, you know? So. Oh. But just not, not to cut you off, but to be honest, I feel like, like you said, um, you mentioned like, uh, you feel like it's a choice that we feel like we don't want to connect with each other. And I feel like I kind of agree with that somewhat because I feel like, um, sometimes we, um, we don't go by, we don't go by like the skin color. We, some people like, I feel like some black people or, or majority, I would say at times go by where they from. Like we live by where we from more than yeah saying all right you like you another black brother we look at it like if like new york wise if a person from brooklyn you from queens it's like but like, you from brooklyn so it's like you know what i mean we the same color but we not looking at it as in, like we here together we looking at it as in, you from brooklyn i don't know about that like and, and and that to me that's corny you know what i mean like if we if we the same skin color we black uh, black brothers then it doesn't matter where i'm from we the same you know we might got different a slight different background but we could relate some way, somehow, and the starting of the relating is our skin color. You know what I mean? But can now I add something time? else? Is it just where you live, or is it sometimes how um, you're dressed, socioeconomic factors, um, um, what social class that you might be part of, education level? Is that something that you think also plays a factor into? I do, and I don't. The reason why I say I, um, I do believe that it is um, somewhat like that is because. A person that's probably nine times out of ten wearing a hoodie, jeans, and Tim's compared to a person that's wearing not the lab but like a, a dashiki. <laughs> it, it'll be more different. Like they will look at it as in like, nah. I, I mean, looking at that brother over there, he might look ghetto compared to looking at a person with a dashiki. They might look educated, you know. So they might look like they more hands on with like a black power movement and everything else. But then when you finally uh, speak to that person with the hoodie on and the Tim's you might realize that this person is educated as well They just they dress code just made a difference and it's like how you know I understand if a person pants is sagging 
but also get to know that person because you never know that person's experience. Also, like you said, as far as in a person's occupation, yes, if somebody, if, if a per, if another black man is a lawyer and they see that this other black guy is maybe a, a just say like a, a teacher, they might feel like they're a little bit higher than them. They might feel like their standards is different. So they judge them by that. Like, man, I'm up here. You a teacher. You, like, they just feel like the occupation difference, the money difference is what makes them different. And it's like, listen, um, we both got a job. The we both, yeah. So I feel like that's what makes the situation where it's like some black, like black on black, they, they do go by dress code. Occupation and everything else. I agree with that. You guys have something you want to add? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> we have to bring you on the radio show just to talk a little bit. <laughs> yeah, but I, I do think that um, anti blackness is um, something that goes, is global. And um, really, I was, I was, I'm grateful to have had a professor at 18, 19 years old that said to me, you know, you bring what you were willing to come, you know, and um, there, there is, um, there's been this deliberate act to make us look like whether it's light skin, dark skin, socioeconomics, whatever, that we're on two different mm -hmm. sides of the fence, and actually we're all on the, da on the same damn side of the fence. Um, the deliberacy shows that we aren't. Um, however, um, we're, we're, we're on the, we're on the same fence when it comes to up against white inferiority complex. That's what I call it. I call it superiority, but white inferiority comp complex and black, um, black and brown people of this world. Um, and, and, and the idea that you aren't says more about the deliberate act being, you know, you, you buying that. Then, um, then if you if you re recognize that we're all on the same side of the fence, regardless of our situations, um, and we get to do powerful things on that side. I, again, I don't, I'm not downtrodden, so we get to do powerful things on this side of the fence. But as long as you think that you on that side of the fence and I'm over here, then we don't obviously have problems. You know? Yeah, I, I see a lot of reckoning for our culture, for cultures in general, because we're not the only cultures that are doing that. Uh, that's uh, operating. That's another thing that's a pet peeve of mine, that black people get pegged as if we're the only ones doing certain things. If you see black men or women being caught up in the media, it's taken as if this is not happening in other cultures. And um, that kind of is just the back kick of being trendsetter, trendsetters. You know, mm -hmm. we have to trend, set the trends in both ways. Um, well, black people don't do that or do this. I'm like, listen, I'm black, so I don't give a shit what I do. Mm. It's black. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I really don't, you know, I don't care what I do as a man. If I, I'm a man and I just did the shit, then do it. You know what I mean? Like, literally, it's about, you know, perspective, I guess. What is, it in, what is some stereotypes of what black men don't do? <laughs> what don't black men do? Um... What are some stereotypes? Oh, I said don't do that. Um, <laughs> that voice too. What black like, men don't do that. What black men don't do? I, I mean, is there anything that's in twenty twenty that black right. men still don't? Yeah, do? that's what I'm saying. To be, to, to be, to be, yeah, to be honest, that, 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 that yeah, that answer. that would be hard because um, I feel like we do a lot. It's just that we don't get acknowledged for it. Yeah, yeah. You feel what I'm saying? Like that's just what it is. Like there's a lot of black men that are. Investing in their they, they community that that got investments in in big companies. It's just we don't get acknowledged for that, you know. We, um, we don't. So it's like what's not observed is more like that that question wound up popping up. What do the black men do? We do a lot. We do a lot. It's just not acknowledged. So that's my answer to that. To be honest, um, like you say, we haven't heard that in a while. What a black man don't do. I feel like a black man is on everything you see. Be honest. I have this thing of also about being black that I've spoken about. It's the feel, and I don't know how it is for other cultures. I see how they do with like, let's say my Caribbean brothers and sisters, with them having to take care of home and literally sending stuff back home to their islands and so forth. I feel like with our culture, 
especially with the successful black men, black people, like you have to kind of give back. You know, if we if we herald a Jay Z or a, a LeBron or something, LeBron can't just be the greatest basketball player. LeBron right. got to build schools. LeBron got to give up. You know, there's always a give back to it. Do you see? <clears throat> do you see that as something that is necessary? as a black man for yourself personally in your own perspective like is that something that you're like touting around like what is it your responsibility to change the narrative essentially as far as in like do i feel um like as if it's something that i would do or just yeah, in general? You personally your, like how you're living your life um, do you feel like you also i feel like it's always best to give back to your people you know i won't ever say it's not best not to do that um but you just gotta have something that's different or something that's more powerful that could keep you know things running. Like, I feel like it's it's necessary to an extent. Like we, um, you like give back in a different form and fashion. Like everything don't have to be like buying a school or whatever the case is. But give back sometimes where you just keep the money rotating in the black community. So that's how I would say. It. Like the name of my business is called World Is Yours and Ours. You know. So I feel like my business is based on unity and community. It's based on a worldwide thing, you know, for black people and, and just unity in general. But, um, yeah, so with that type of business that I have going on, I feel like, yeah, I would give back. And it, it got to be something deeper than just, you know, something. Like, it got to be bigger than what it is, yeah. basically. Okay. Um, I think this question is interesting because um, a couple of days ago, I remember uh, a interview that I saw with Tupac. And Tupac said that... Um, like he wasn't going to be the person to change the world, but he was going to spark the what the idea of other person to change the world. Yeah, yeah. and like I like at first I used to think like, oh, it's my legacy to do something like that. But now I don't really think of it as my legacy. I think of it as like, you know, like uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, like it's the, the pyramid, and it's like we have, each level is like a different need of what we want. And for like for me, <clears throat> like mastery is like top pinnacle of the pyramid mm -hmm. and it's like once you reach the top pinnacle of it like it it comes back down so it's like all the different needs that you have you have all these different things in life like for my my experience it's like I'm content I'm happy you know I'm in like a good place but once I get to the top part of mastery it's like everything I've ever learned or the people that I know like I connect them and I like bring it back down mm -hmm. like you know to the world and I connect people or I haven't built a school, you know, anything like that. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. How do you right. connect people, Demarcus? Tell us what you do. Um, I think, I think for me to connect people, it, re it requires me to be connected. It requires me to like um, have like, you know, like to listen to have like some type of relationship with them. And I don't know. I I think I've always n noticed that when I was younger, but I don't think I knew how to like hone into it. Like I could like have a conversation with Nussie and say, we could just have a conversation. And she could tell me like what she's looking for or she needs this or she's looking for a person that does x y and z and then it's like i'm like then talia may like ask me to like oh let's go to lunch and then we're just talking about something and i'm like yo i know somebody who is looking for somebody like you and then i'll just connect them like that you know so well man look we could have built Easily slipped into the second hour of this, man. Yes. There's so much more that we talk about. Every time we start one of these conversations, we realize it can't be done in a 50-minute radio show, right? So we get to continue this conversation. Um, we are having the Men's Perspective Conference on April 25th, where we do plan on continuing this conversation. Yes, yeah, so it's going to be an all-day event, the uh, 25th of April. It's going to be dope. Stay tuned for more details. On so let us know how we can follow you and support you. Um, let us, yeah. Well, um, you can follow me on Instagram, which my Instagram would be Q the Photographer. Uh, Q D A P H O T O G R A P H E R. You can follow me on there. Also, for my clothing page and photography page, which would be in my pop, which would be in my bio. Um, it would be cute to photography and world is yours and ours. And yes, you can find me on Instagram. Yes. <laughs> you can um you can find me on Facebook and on Instagram, LinkedIn. They're all the same as Demarcus M C G. Um website DemarcusMogoy dot com. Demarcus D E M A R C U S M C G A U G H E Y dot com. Thank you. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram. 
follow me at Afros and Audio, um, at Afros and Audio, uh, Afros and Audio dot com, Vanguard Podcast Network, Vanguard Podcast Network dot com, and Vanguard po- Vanguard PN um, on Instagram, and Coach to Live on Instagram, Coach underscore to Live T A R B. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you all. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks for having me. Thank y'all for having Appreciate this, uh, this conversation with us. As Nussie said, this was this is just a part of this conversation. We're gonna bring this up again because when we did it in DC, when we did it here, it was one of those things like, wow, we really never get to talk about that. And, and we 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 didn't even really get into mental illness uh, in that part of that conversation conversation today. Mm-hmm which is a whole nother part, but I'm glad that we got to get these different perspectives today and the viewers get to hear these dynamic black men um, and different perspectives. I'm grateful, I'm grateful for Nussie for, for the creating this space that we can have this. Man, we're gonna keep doing this. We're gonna keep rocking. We have the men's conference coming up April 25th. Yes. That's coming up, it's coming soon. And we have to hope to have you guys back on there and join us for that day. Um, like Jarrell said, thank you guys again for being with us today. Um, this was a wonderful episode. Um, please follow, share us on I, at Instagram at i.amperspective. And you can also follow us on our website, www.iamperspective.com. Um, and coming up next, we have Speak Into Existence with May I Speak. That's it. It's a wrap. What? No, tonight. Okay. So our the show goes up Tuesdays from six to seven. So this episode is going to premiere yeah. March thirty first. <laughs> I know you want to go, so let's put you real quick on this. Badass with an attitude. Attitude, attitude. Yeah. Leave your quit. Uptown boogie down, punk bitch. Uptown. Nigga, don't forget it again. Her all these bitches wanna fuck with me now. Nah, keep the same energy. CEO, head honcho, and press president. Whenever you addressing me, two seater skirt, skirt in my whip. Skirt, skirt.